Necro. And this here is Rama. Uh, this game is a point and click adventure game, very much so in the same style as Myst. Um, and it's set in the sci-fi universe from the, the uh, series of uh, books by Arthur C. Clarke with the same name. Uh, during uh, this run, um, you'll see various alien cultures, alien devices, you have to figure out how to work with them, and in particular, there will be some um, alien mathematical systems. And at the end of the run, thanks to the generous donations to Water Aid made uh, prior to the start, uh, I will actually do a quick little presentation uh, explaining how to do those alien math puzzles. And uh, also, I'll just drop a little mention uh, again. Later on today, I will be doing the Outpost 2 speedrun, and that one has a uh, donation bid war as well, also raising funds for the same charity. And the winner of that bid war will uh, wind up being the um, uh, particular version of that run that I do. For this game here, though, um, Quick, one more quick thing I'll mention before I jump into it. I will be skipping basically all of the plot. You can hit the escape key at any time in order to just instantly stop any video that is playing. And this is one of those CD-based games, so it's, it's a lot of uh, pre-rendered video um, that they tell the story through. So I'll try to retroactively explain what it is that just occurred. Uh, with no further ado, Let's go ahead and get things started in five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, so uh, I start off in base camp. Uh, we are a team of 12 astronauts that are exploring an alien spaceship. It's approximately cylindrically shaped. It's called Rama, and we are trying to figure out what its deal is, why it's here in our solar system, and all that good stuff. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is uh, apparently uh, probably fail a trick because I was a little slow, so I'll do it this way just to be sure I get it, the important part. There we go. So I was a little slow on raiding uh, Miss uh, Sabatini's locker, um, so I had to just unlock it and then go over to the other spot. So I quickly skipped a introduction from uh, Richard Wakefield, who's one of the friendly astronauts uh, that we'll be uh, interacting with. And uh, in that introduction, he offered me a robot that was in his locker. So I went and picked that up, but there is a pretty long unskippable audio scene that happens. Uh, where the cable car comes back and that's how they lock you in the initial area. Um, but I skipped that anyway by causing Miss Sabatini's um, message to come in at that same time. So I'm visiting a couple of... Oh, wait, did I miss a location? No. I think I just... Yeah, I got unlucky. Okay. So um, I'm exploring various locations in Rama. Rama has a bunch of preset locations and also a bunch of... Uh, random encounter locations. I'm, I caused the game to believe that I progressed enough just by visiting a couple of the preset locations to cause a particular random meeting with, again, uh, Richard Wakefield, uh, in order to uh, pick up a lens that he had. And meeting with him then caused the game's overall meeting with other astronauts state to advance forward enough that the game believed that I had already met with uh, Miss de Jardin for the second time. So I did the third meeting with her in which she gives me one of these tiles. I'm picking up various tiles as I'm moving along. I also put the lenses into that laser cannon. Mind you, there's no controls on the laser cannon, so I had no particular reason to believe that the laser cannon wasn't just going to kill all the invaders on the uh, spaceship that we just boarded. But as it turns out, it just melted this cube that had another tile that I want to have. Now I have to wait for a little while outside of um, uh, this building here is codenamed London. Um, there's also Bangkok. I'll be visiting that later. I need to wait for the ninth laser blast on the force field, then I can go through. 
um, turn off the force field because I'll be coming back here later. And now we'll start seeing why I've been collecting all these tiles. These tiles are connected to these uh, IQ test sorts of puzzles. I need to identify the correct tile to put in. There's a pair of these puzzles that are linked together that are not at all random in how they appear. Um, then there is a uh, cycle of four such tile uh, puzzles in a row afterward, which um, those ones, the initial state is random. So I have done both of the preset ones, and amusingly, if I had failed out of that first puzzle, the tile I needed for the second uh, one that would have been offered as an alternate uh, would have moved outside of this building as if by magic, um, and would wind up in base camp as if some other uh, astronaut had found it. Anyway, uh, I'm now exploring the lower reaches of London, this is kind of the, the dump of uh, Rama. Uh, there's a recycling facility and um, I am picking up a bunch of tiles that wound up there. Uh, a lot more tiles can wind up in that area too, but only if um, you miss an opportunity to pick them up. The tiles kind of move over time and uh, if you miss some opportunities to get them earlier on, then um, the crab biots, um, those are pri biological robots, um, will pick them up, put them in trash compactors, and then they'll be sent here. Um, so that kind of makes the game feel more random than it actually is. I got a little unlucky with the initial tile puzzle I got in the four cycle, um, where I have the solutions to half of the puzzles, but the first one I got was one that I don't yet have the solution to because the relevant tile is presently uh, gooped up um, in my inventory. So I'll need to clean it, which I'll do shortly. Uh, also, I just skipped a cutscene where I was informed that one of the astronauts died while trying to uh, steal one of the, well, capture one of the uh, crab biots. And now I'm going to stop talking for a little bit because I need to focus to try to get a uh, like 30 second or so skip. Um, there we go, got it, sweet. So that skip there is actually not in the present world record run for this game. Um, that's a more recent find by me. So that is a 30 second or so animation that is normally unskippable, but by just rushing there after um, the screen started shaking there, which indicated a trajectory change from Rama, um, I was able to uh, get myself into that unskippable cutscene and let the incoming phone call from um, uh, the guy that was telling me, oh, hey, that sound that you heard was Rama going on an impact course with Earth, which, you know, has people kind of jittery now. Um, so that message interrupted that animation and sped things along quite a bit. So now I've collected all of the objects. This uh, filtration device uh, was from the... Um, the refrigerator. Some other astronaut put it there for unknown reasons. Anyway, um, that is enough to get this cleaning machine operational. So that's what I'm going to work on next. I'm going to clean up those gooped up tiles so that I can actually use them in the tile puzzles. So I'll go ahead and grab this. Um, here's the other gooped up tile. Clean it. Uh, this inventory system's a little picky. Um, you get to place the object exactly in the spot you want, but if you click if you click exactly on top of an existing item, then you swap the two, which is not usually what I want to do. Although I did do that intentionally there, kind of an unusual circumstance. Anyway, um, because I haven't been picking up any of the decoy tiles, which by the way, there's like 20 or more decoy tiles scattered across uh, the planes here. Um, because I've been skipping the incorrect tiles, the correct ones are pretty different from each other, so it's pretty easy for me to quickly identify which puzzle I have and which pieces need to go into it. And now I have perhaps not the most challenging puzzle of uh, the series. This is 
um, what I call Simon Says. On each floor of Bangkok, there's going to be a series of math puzzles um, that just test your ability to interact with the math system of one of the three species that is alien to the Raman spacecraft that has boarded it. And of course, the first alien species is humans. So, um, or at least that's the first one we're going to go through here. So as a human, it's pretty easy for me to just go through this section. And uh, the reason I call that machine there, Simon says, is that it, it's just, you have a bunch of numbers and you have to punch what it, in the number that it says. And there's not really any uh, uh, elaborate continuation from there. So I'll go ahead and solve that puzzle, which will get me to the second floor. This is for the avian and myrmicat cultures. The myrmicats are a wall. We'll discuss them more later. Um, but first, I need to skip a cutscene, or at least the portion of the cutscene that I can skip from Richard Wakefield, uh, who once again is the guy who comes over and uh, talks with us. And now we have avian math. This math is in base 16, and it uses symbols that are very much so not human uh, math symbols, but um, it all works basically the same. And at the end of the run, uh, thanks to the donation incentive being met, I will in fact do a quick little lecture about how to uh, actually deal with this. So once again, this is the Simon Says puzzle. Um, this one just unlocks the door to get further into the building. There, this time though, I will have to do the counting puzzle, which is in the middle machine. There's also an optional puzzle set on the right machine of each set of three where that optional uh, puzzle will give you, eventually, if you do all of them, the reward where you get a, a cube that helps you convert between the math systems, which in principle, if you've done the puzzles, you probably don't need that system anymore. So, um, in any case, we have now unlocked the door and now it's time to do the counting part. So, in this case, um, the numbers that it, the numbers of objects that I have to count, um, first of all, they're arranged in row, horizontal rows of up to 11. So that was a full row there. So I punched in 11 and said, I'm done. Okay, so that one there is 15. Also a single digit number in base 16. Uh, anything 16 or larger is two digits or more, depending. Uh, so that one is seven zero. Because only certain numbers are programmed into the game to be able to show up, the fact that I saw there was a lot of stuff and then two left over at the end told me immediately that that had to uh, be the number that I wound up punching in. Um, and then that one was nine rows. Again, I just have these numbers pre-converted and I've got a cheat sheet in front of me so that I can do this faster than I would do it if I was actually having to do all of this uh, math on, on the fly. All right, so that gives me a tile I'm going to need once I go to New York, which is um, a bunch of buildings. Um, it's considered a city by the humans, and it basically is. But it's a bunch of buildings in the middle of the cylindrical sea. Uh, again, Rama is a cylindrically shaped spaceship, so uh, there's a band of water in the middle. And I need to do this machine now for Octomath. Okay. So now it's time for the Octo Spider math. And here we've got base eight. And wait, is that six or seven? That's seven. So the extra catch with the Octo Spider math is that uh, there are no symbols per se. Instead, different colors represent the different numbers. So go ahead and get started on this. Most of the numbers it's allowed to show you in uh, the Octo Spider counting puzzle. For some reason, most of them are multiples of 11. So that does make um, converting into my table of pre-solved solutions um, a lot easier than it otherwise could be. Three digit number there. Um, anything 64 or larger will need to be at least three digits um, in base eight. So there we go. We have now picked up both of the items we needed um, 
from those machines. And then on my way out, uh, something I've been skipping that's been your main reward for getting to each of these floors up to this point was there's these museums to each of the alien cultures. And I just grabbed from that museum, um, there was a broken exhibit that had a wire cutter, which as it turns out, I'm going to need like right now. So <laughs> I've gone ahead and picked that up. Oh, uh, that's not where I want it to be. I want it to be here. Okay, so there's this broken biot, and I skipped a cutscene where that avian got caught in it. So now we're going to become best friends forever with this avian. He gives us this friendship bracelet to prove our friendship later, so we'll need that. Um, and then moving on, back into the middle of this wheel structure. I skipped a long animation here before. That long animation showed the release of a whole bunch of spider biots, which are like these guardian things. You don't want to mess with them. Thankfully, we don't have to do any of the remaining uh, random events. So the risk of accidentally running into a spider biot and getting killed basically just doesn't exist. Anyway, I got a data cube that explained that a bunch of people were missing. I didn't actually plug the data cube into my wrist comp, but that's what that would have been about. The wrist comp is basically a smartphone, but it's strapped to your wrist and it's uh, got a keyboard and stuff. Anyway, I now need to switch disks, which I'll do by ejecting my virtually mounted disk and then mounting the next one, also virtually. And now I should be good to go. All right. So I just have ISOs for the CDs from the game. The game was three CDs uh, long, and the third CD is literally just interviews with Arthur C. Clarke and Gentry Lee, who are the, the writers of the series of books that this was based off of. Anyway, we're now entering New York. This is the entirety of uh, Disc 2 is this place. And um, first thing I'm going to do is go to this device here. I'll use this tile I picked up from the, the hub of the wheel uh, using a gate. Um, that was previously holding the spider biots back, uh, but because it was ripped off its hinges, we were able to use it as a ladder. That's the one piece of really stupid moon logic that this game has. Adventure games are a little infamous for having really dumb solutions to puzzles you just have to know or randomly guess because they don't really make a lot of sense. That's the biggest instance of that in this game. There's a couple other kind of weird things, but you can reason your way through them. We're actually coming up on one of the other ones pretty soon here. But first I need to visit all three of the plazas within New York. Uh, New York is divided into three main areas. Uh, this area here is for the octo spiders. The one I was just in was intended for humans, but it hasn't been set up yet because we haven't set up a culture here yet. Um, we're gonna be abducted by the way. It's basically how that's gonna go. And I'm going to use some of these gems I've been picking up uh, in order to unlock some stuff from the Octospires, and 19 is the number. Okay, 19, I'll have to remember that. Blue-yellow gem will unlock this other gem that I'll need later to move around in the Octospider layer. But first, I need to rotate this prism in order to hack this lock. Uh, this prism, being a prism, will split white light into uh, different components. So I rotate it so that the split um, puts the right colors in the right places to unlock the uh, prism there. And then I'll use the prism to open the way to the door to the octo spider layer, but I won't enter just yet. I'm required to do the um, the avian layer first. So turn on this. Uh, and this puzzle goes a lot faster in the DOS version of the game. I could run the DOS version instead. However, the DOS version crashes a lot more than the Windows 95 version does. Windows 95 version will still sometimes crash, but I have backup saved so I won't lose too much time if it happens. But for whatever reason, the uh, Windows 95 version of this game, this flashing, which is supposed to take like a quarter second for each lock-in, um, it takes like five seconds for each. So that is like 15 seconds lost just because I'm playing the Windows 95 version. But I'll take having a game that works over having a game that's a tiny bit faster any day. <laughs> Anywho, oops, I overshot. I'm going now back to the avian area because I now have an object that I needed in order to get into the, the living quarters here. And okay, I got lost a little bit there. Um, moving around in some of these plazas is I think really confusing, but it's not random, it's just strange. <laughs> 
Anyhow, I now have a quick little break here where I'm going to be uh, just putting this uh, tuning fork in for six cycles of moving the ramp I just walked past. This will eventually move the ramp into the correct position where it'll let me into the one door that's actually open. And this will ultimately give me access to a piston I'm going to use to destroy a totem pole in order to use it as a ladder <laughs> to get up to a chair, which I will use as a stepping stool in order to reach a thing that's just a little bit out of reach. Mind you, I've got a crowbar in my inventory. I used it to rescue the other avian earlier, but the game absolutely refuses to allow me to use that. Yeah, I instead have to destroy a whole bunch of ramen equipment. So that's what we'll do. Um, here we go. Uh, destroy that thing and for some reason hitting the escape key did not work i um, not sure what happened there and I got a little turned around but okay we're we're good to go now we're, we're back where we're supposed to be uh, and I went a little too far there okay step up to here use the friendship bracelet and then also the stepping stool in order to use that um, and now I can use this device to demonstrate that I know that this object here is something that is important to the avians. That is uh, what the book series calls a mana melon, um, where uh, that's basically the food source for the avians. It may also be the egg form of the myrmicats. It's not entirely clear to me, uh, but in any case, I will be taking this room here a little slow because this room tends to crash if you try to do it too fast. So I will take the mana melon that was offered to me, use the knife form of the multi-tool in order to cut it open, use the spoon in order to eat it, and you'll see I'm tripping out. Um, you can see ultraviolet light while you are high on the melon, so that's neat, and that's used to gather some information that incidentally I already know, so I'm not going to actually do that part of the puzzle because I already have that information. Uh, now I need to wait for the fanfare to start. There we go, okay. If that fanfare doesn't happen and you try to leave the room, the game crashes. So, uh, crash avoided. And that happens like no matter what in the um, uh, the DOS version. So that's one of the reasons I don't like the DOS version. Anyway, um, a number I'm supposed to look up at a point in the future is this code here to get the monitoring station that I think the Myrmicats used to use um, to show the classroom. I then extended a um, uh, ladder, no, stairway? Yeah, I'm gonna call it a stairway uh, in the classroom area. Um, so that's an area I'll go to eventually and that'll shortcut my trip uh, to getting to where the Myrmicats used to be. Um, for now though, um, the avians who are much less advanced than the Myrmicats were, they, they have a whole bunch of technology that's kind of falling apart. I oil this thing so I can at least use it and extend the bridge and get to the other side of the living quarters here. I'll now go up, turn around, and this is the area I call the hatchery. Um, okay, and... Oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, figuring out the right combination of arrows to move where you want to go is a little confusing sometimes, but I got it. And now I'm out of this room. And now I'm going to head down to the classroom I mentioned before because I have acquired a uh, grappling hook that I'll use to get down to where the Myrmicats used to live. And this place is all burned out and ruined and there's no Myrmicats here, which is apparently a big problem for the avians because they understand how to use all this fancy technology, but they don't know understand how it works. So if it breaks, it just stays broken. Um, anyway. Um, I used the caustic liquid to um, break apart the gunk that was preventing my access to uh, this object, uh, to the device that I needed to use in order to clear the pond that was blocking my access to that pendant. Now I have both those pendants and now I will be able to enter both the human and the octospider living quarters on Rama. Um, but first, in order to escape the avian region, I need to pick up this magnetic card, which is used in order to operate the ledges in order to get in and out. 
So that's the human pendant. This one's the octo spider pendant. I'll try to remember which one's which because the icons down in the inventory don't really make it super clear just by looking at it. And the way the inventory in this game works leads me to often not wind up with everything in the same spot from one instance of playing the game to the next. Anyway, I'm continuing to use this device here to squawk like an avian. Um, I just need to say the correct numbers in order to uh, go through uh, these things. Whoops, that was a misclick. There we go. Um, and now I go in here. In the classroom, there was a, a mural I was supposed to uh, use. Whoops, that's wrong. Six, nine, eight is what I want. There we go. Um, there was a mural I was supposed to use a mana melon in order to uh, uh, view the ultraviolet portion of, in order to see the numbers I needed to punch in there, in order to extend the ledges so I could get back out. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, in order to get back out of the uh, avian area. So now I'm out, and oh, by the way, there's a nuclear bomb. Uh, did I mention there was a nuclear bomb? We brought three on board, and they've all been armed. As it turns out, they're networked together, so if we disarm one, they'll all be disarmed. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, everyone except um, uh, Richard Wakefield and... Um, uh, uh, Nicole Desjardins, um, have, let's see, where's the human thing? Okay, there we go, got it. Okay, um, everyone except those two have abandoned Rama and said, you know what, this is on a crash course with Earth, it's safer if we just blow it up. So they're just gonna blow it up. We're still inside it, so we don't want that to happen. That's yellow indigo, okay, so that's, um, uh, the code I need to get through here. There's a lot of stuff you're supposed to do here in the Octo Spider region that we're just not going to do. You're supposed to crash a Octo Spider dance party, and we just don't because we don't have to. Because your reward for going through most of the plot of uh, this area is a bunch of things from Matthew O'Toole. Matthew O'Toole was a friendly guy. He was a general. He was the guy who set the disarm code for the nuclear bombs that we now need to disarm. Uh, he had a particular favorite series of prime numbers and uh, which numbers were involved in the code are kind of scattered across like his old ID card, his uh, anniversary photo and that sort of thing. As it turns out though, only one number is actually random and that's the one on the back of the anniversary photo that we already picked up. So as a result, the only thing we actually require from the Octo Spider region is this green laser pointer. So we just sent Falstaff, who's this little robot guy, also from Richard Wakefield, because he's apparently the star of the show. Um, red, also indigo, okay. Um, so Falstaff was used as a tiny little guy who went down a tiny little uh, subway system and met the tiny little baby Octo Spiders and I think that's correct yes okay and the tiny little baby octo spiders then um uh, you're supposed to befriend them by getting some food for them but instead we just grabbed the laser pointer and ran <laughs> so um yeah we we skipped most of the octo spider layer but we're now done with it okay and there we go. And we're now out of the Octo Spider region. We have the uh, laser pointer we need in order to get the um, the crane biot to lift a spider biot that would otherwise be blocking my access to the nuclear bomb. You see, the the various biots of Rama um, saw that the humans left this device around. Uh, it was a nuclear bomb. They didn't necessarily know that. They just said, oh, hey, this is clearly something you guys want to have, so we'll put it in your living area, and then we'll guard it for you. Um, okay, I think that's actually the wrong spot. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's that way. I sure hope I'm right on that. Okay, so this is a little test here to make sure that you're a human, basically. Um, we need to identify that we are from Earth by correctly identifying the relative sizes 
of the organisms uh, that were depicted. So we do that, and now that allows us to reach this piston that uh, extends a bridge that'll let us go to the intended human living quarters, which are a little barren right now, but it's got a nuclear bomb and that's all you really need in life, right? Um, anyhow, uh, I went too far. There we go. So since the bomb was set, the t clock has actually been ticking. As it turns out, if you... Um, left the the color matching puzzle with the levers from before until the bomb was set every single fiddling will of that counts as three minutes of in-game time passing so that would have been a mess uh it's hard to beat the game if you put yourself in that situation anyway so i move over here to the mirror and this by the way is not how lasers work <laughs> that is not how reflecting lasers would appear whatever anyway now it's time for me to do the uh, bar bomb disarming puzzle. Um, the way this works is that the first and the last numbers are always the same numbers. And the middle three have two of the numbers always being picked uh, from a particular set. And then uh, the last number is randomly selected from the uh and is based on the thing we saw on the back of the uh anniversary photo and time is coming up pretty soon as soon as i in as soon as i uh leave here and then enter the final cutscene. and uh, i know there's a little bit of a actually there isn't anyway time okay and there we go that is rama and uh, so the way that worked was the middle three numbers had their order random and one of the numbers was random, but we got to see the last two digits of the first of those three and the, sec the first two digits of the second of those two three, and that was enough to determine which was which. Uh, so I did that much of the logic on the fly. Now Brahma is speeding out of the solar system. It's changed its course again. It's not going to impact Earth. And now Arthur C. Clarke has some words. Though he can't imagine why it took me so long. That taunt directly at a speedrunner is exactly why I decided I was going to speedrun this game and see if that message changed if you played the game sufficiently quickly. It didn't. <laughs> uh, so that felt like a pretty good run overall. I did slow down a little bit in a couple places so I could talk a little bit more clearly. Um, I am curious what my time was. If someone could post that in chat, that would be great because I don't actually have the uh, stream um, playing on my side and I didn't actually get my uh, live split running either. So I'm a little bit on the dark in the dark on that. 29.35, not quite a new world record, stopped by exactly a minute from getting a new world record, but still a very good time. I consider anything below 30 minutes to be quite good. So feel nice about that. Uh, this fellow talking, by the way, is Arthur C. Clarke again. He's the, the writer of the book series. So uh, we have now saved Rama from being destroyed by overzealous uh, people with nuclear bombs. Um, we also have Nicole de Jardin and uh, Richard, Richard Wakefield alongside us uh, heading out into deep space. And supposedly there was going to be another game that would more or less follow the third book of the series. This game more or less followed the second book of the series uh, with some notable changes. But that game never got made, so you can't play it. <laughs> Anyway, um, with a little bit of transition here, I'll head over to do the uh, Octo Math, Octo Spider, and uh, Avian Math uh, explanation lecture thing. I just need to flip over to uh, that uh, version of my layout. So if I could be put on. Um, transition screen for a bit that would be spectacular let me know when i am is indistinguishable from magic so join us again for a second rom adventure okay here we go sorry 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 <laughs> uh okay apparently um i didn't actually add the microphone to this particular scene we're, we should be good now, though. 
Uh, welcome back. And let me make sure that my music is playing. And there we go. OK. Try again. So uh, welcome to the uh, school portion of the Rama speed run. This is brought to you by uh, the donations to Water Aid. Uh, this is Buckeye Speed Bash, and we're raising funds for that charity. In Rama, we've got two different uh, math systems that uh, we work with during the game. Uh, we've got the avians and the myrmicats, although the myrmicats themselves are missing. Um, it's base 16 is what they use, and uh, there's 16 different symbols involved. Um, and I'll get into a little more detail about that later. But uh, also, I'll note that we've got the octo spiders. The octo spiders are a little bit creepier than the avians, and uh, they use base eight, and they use colors instead of symbols, but fundamentally it still works pretty much the same way. But before I get into talking about how the alien math systems work, I'll, in, I'll start off here by discussing a little bit of review about how human math works. So in typical math uh, problems you'd encounter in school or, you know, doing anything, uh, we generally use base 10. So we've got 10 different numerals that we use uh, for each of our digits, and uh, they number from 0 to 9. In order to express anything 10 or larger, we need multiple digits. So... Um, in particular, if you have the number 115, what that actually means is that you've got one instance of 100 of the thing you're counting, one instance of 10 of the thing you're counting, and five things left over. The fact that we're using 10 and then 10 uh, groups of 10 for each successive column in the number representation is what base 10 is all about. There's nothing special about the number 10, though. We can just as easily work with base 16. So that's what the avians use. Uh, they have base 16. These digits simply number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are all individually represented by those individual numerals. Uh, I will note that uh, if you do some computer programming, the uh, it is fairly common to use base 16 because you can use two base 16 digits to cleanly represent one byte, and that's a common uh, division of uh, data that a computer would use. So... Uh, in that case, humans would just do 0 through 9, and then they'd use A, B, C, D, E, F. And that's sometimes what you'll see in error messages and that sort of a thing um, from uh, computer programs crashing and that kind of thing. So um, let's take the number 116 here. This is, if you get down to it, it's uh, rows of 11, and there's 10 of those rows, so that's 110 plus six more. So that's 116 is how we would refer to it. But if you're dealing with base 16 math, you would group it into sets of 16, and that would be seven sets of 16. So write seven in the 16s column instead of the tens column. And then there's four left over, so then that's four after that. And that's how you write 116 in base 16. Um, and that's sufficient to get you through all the mandatory um, math puzzles of the game. There's also some arithmetic, and I'll uh, discuss the arithmetic stuff um, a little bit later on, um, because that one's optional from the game. But first... I'll go to Octo Spider Math. Octo Spider Math uses base 8. Same concept, uh, but instead of having more symbols, this time we have fewer. Um, Octo Spiders use colors, uh, and they are ordered in the same order of the rainbow. So this is long wavelength colors, short wavelength colors over here. If you're playing the game, the hardest part of it is probably distinguishing between indigo and violet. Um, those are really close together as far as a human's concerned. And then if you need a zero, that's white, which, you know, makes sense. 
So, uh, in uh, translating the same number before, 116, in this case, we can't actually write it out using just two digits because 77 would be the biggest number we could write, or I guess it would be violet. Violet would be the, be the biggest number that we could write in base eight in two digits, but that would only be 63. The next number up is 64. It's eight times larger than eight. So uh, there's one block of 64 here, six blocks of eight, and then four left over. So 164 is how you would write that, and that turns out to be red, indigo, uh, green. And one more little note, uh, they use this little line on the left side of a number to indicate that this is the start of a number. That's the information you're about to get. If you had two instances of the same number in a row, it would just be the same color, but twice as wide. There's no additional separation between uh, the digits from there. So let's talk a little bit about arithmetic now. Um, the game on the third puzzle of each of the floors of Bangkok will present you with addition and subtraction problems. There's a couple ways you can approach that. So first of all, uh, the symbol that the avians use for addition is a full melon. That's my interpretation of what it's supposed to be. Um, and then it'll be two circles within each other uh, to represent a half melon, and that's subtraction. And then a melon cut in half is the equal sign. So there's a couple ways you could go about trying to do the math. You could simply convert each number back to base 10, do the math yourself normally, and then convert back to base 16. It'd be kind of complicated for the larger numbers to do it that way, though. Because at that point, you're not just dealing with the 1s column and the 16s column. You're also dealing with the 256s column and the 4096s column. So you could you say, okay, 4 times 4096 plus 1 times 256, etc. Eventually come up with the number uh, 31,100. Convert that back to base 16 using a whole bunch of division. And then you would eventually get this correct answer down here. But the more fun and probably faster way to deal with it would instead be to do uh, just long addition in base 16. So, for example, if we look on the left side, it's pretty easy. You've got 4 plus 3 is 7. 1 plus 8 is 9. Uh, there is trading on the right side, though. This is 15, and that is 13. So, uh, 15, as it turns out, is 16 minus 1. So kind of like how you would use nine in addition, I'm going to do the same thing here. 15 plus 13 is 12 carry one, because that's one short of 13, and then there's trading on top of that. So carry the one into the next line. This is zero, this is six. Six plus one is seven, because we were carrying from the previous line. So that gets you to the answer seven, nine, seven, 12. A little bit faster, I think, than converting the numbers all the way. Same concept works in OctoSpider uh, math. However, you do have to look out a little bit more for correctly counting how many spaces of the same color you have in a row, as well as identifying whether this is indigo or uh, violet. In this case, uh, all the instances here are violet. So I'll just go through um, how you get at the answer working within base eight here. So this is violet plus blue. Uh, violet is seven, it's one short of eight. So once again, this is basically blue minus one, and then you carry one. So that's blue minus one is green, of course. Everyone knows that. <laughs> and then carry one into the next column. That is red there. Blue plus one plus one is violet, because that, that brings you up to seven. Uh, blue is five, by the way. And then next column, blue plus white. White is zero, so it does nothing to it. And then white plus green, once again, nothing happens to the green. And then green plus yellow, that's three plus four, which is, once again, seven. So you wind up with that answer. That was because that was addition. Uh, the addition symbol for the octo spiders is a white bar with red notches. Uh, subtraction is a white bar with blue notches. 
equal sign is the yellow bar with white notches. And um, as one uh, final little bonus thing, uh, I will point out that when I was a kid, I had a little bit of fun with my eighth grade math homework where I just used avian math for my math homework for like a quarter of the school year before anyone actually noticed. So uh, this is what that homework wound up looking like. Um, uh, use discretion before doing this at home for any uh, kids watching here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it 100% depends on whether the teacher is on board with this happening or not. Um, my teacher was, so just stuck with it. And yeah, that, that's what it looks like. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to the rest of the marathon. I do have one more run. It'll be Outpost 2 later. But first, we've got some other great runs. So um, thanks and uh, have a good day.